Hello and welcome to podcast.init. Today we are recording on April 21st, 2015. Your hosts today are Tobias Macy and Chris Patty. And today we're happy to be speaking with a few of the members of the Kibi core development team. So, Ryan, if you would please start off by introducing yourself. All right, yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan. I'm a developer in Kansas City. I uh, originally am from Washington State. I've been programming since I was like nine or ten. And uh, my favorite part of programming is making the computer talk to other things and make them do stuff. So, like from routing drivers to interface with hardware, or making my phone control my TV and computer. Gabriel, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hey, yeah, so I'm Gabriel Petit. I'm uh, from France. Uh, I'm living near, Par- near Paris right now. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a computer scientist too, and I've been working uh, in the industry for a few years now. And I started uh, programming like in, uh, when I was a teenager. And I, I've been uh, really interested uh, in this and how to, to make things, things work so the way I want. And I've been tinkering uh, since then. And uh, so uh, I've been uh, playing with Python because uh, as soon as I uh, found it, uh, I I was like in love because it was the first language to to make so much sense. So mm-hmm. so I was so I've been uh, very happy to to be able to, to work with it uh, since. Uh, and uh, so uh, that's how I came to Kiwi because uh, it was a great framework uh, in uh, in Python. So I came and gave a hand. So that's for me. And Matthew. So, um, hi. First, thanks for thinking to making a podcast about us. It was a, a real surprise for all of us. Great. So, um, I'm Matthew Rebel, 32 years old, and I love music and I love programming. And it's um, the same as um, uh, Ryan. I learned about uh, when I was 10 years old. Uh, It was literally writing something I got on a book on a screen. Even if I didn't knew how to run it, it was like opening, edit, typing, edit, command line, writing some things, and then try to rename the file with a dot com, doesn't work, dot execute, (laughs) doesn't work, dot bat, doesn't work. Until uh, my uncle started to teach me what was programming exactly. Teach me to basic, uh, teach me to fizzle basic. Uh, it was actually working uh, in that, uh, in the police uh, department. And then computer science, I did a lot of stuff. Uh, it's like full stack development from the kernel, from the script, from managing servers, uh, system administrator, uh, web security, I don't know. And until I got, uh, I find Python, and I wanted to do a project with um, the music in Python. And well, the rest of the story, I guess, it would be on the next question we will ask. But that's the thing. <laughs> so, how did you folks get introduced to Python initially? Well, on my side, it was on Linux, uh, like Linux affair. It's like um, a French website uh, talking about a lot of uh, Linux stuff and operation stuff. And it was really when I was sick of doing all the same stuff in C, managing a list, um, thinking always about memory, creating class is taking a lot of time. And I was wanting to focus on the artist side I wanted to create not to do the same things all over again. And Linux Affair just showed me a solution about it, and it was called Python. This is how it started. Well, uh, I can I can go on that too, because uh, I was I started uh, developing with uh, QBasic at first, and uh, for a number of years when I was a teenager, I, I only tinkered with this, and when I st- started learning other languages, I was surprised because you know, I didn't find anything that was as easy to to learn, and that but uh, so it seemed like the power of uh, to do f- complex things had to to use uh, very more much more complex languages, 
And uh, so I was ready to, to let go of simplicity. But uh, when I found Python, I was uh, like shocked because uh, it was even simpler and uh, a lot, lot better than everything I have I have found uh, until now. So I uh, uh, I, I just I started with, when I was in um, in a computer course. I, I, I was uh, learning about uh, a lot of stuff in computer science, but there was no 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 course about uh, python but i just found a little book about python and uh, learned the basics of the syntax uh, and uh and got from there uh, i taught my taught it uh, on my own uh taught it myself so so it was uh, like yeah uh, finding the, the right language for my mind so it was quite a discovery that's very cool. It's always neat to hear when people sort of, you know, have these problems, and especially when it, you know, it's at the intersection of of art and technology. That's great. Ryan, why don't you go ahead and tell us about how you got introduced to Python? Well, uh, we needed to rewrite the software in our work, and the old software was written using Zool Runner. It was all in JavaScript, and it was just horrible. It was slow. It was hard to work on. Poorly designed. So I was looking for something that I could use for make, making desktop applications. And I didn't really want to do C, C++. I wanted it to run on Linux. I wanted something with rapid development capabilities. And looking around, I found Python. And I fell in love with it once I got past the lack of braces. <laughs> <laughs> Akshay, thank you for joining us. Could you just give a brief introdu introduction and tell us about how you got introduced to Python? Hi guys, Akshay here. Yeah. Okay, uh, now I got introduced to Python. Essentially, I started with, uh, we were working on multi touch tables at that time, um, 2011, I think. And I was looking for frameworks that were working on those. And the only two available options at that time were Kiwi and uh, MT4J. I don't know if you've heard yeah, of that. Yeah, MT4J, yeah. Yeah, so in my research, I found out that the only option that was any good for me was uh, Kiwi. So that's how I started and came into Python. Kiwi was the first thing that I uh, worked on with Python. Great. So, uh, anyone who knows the story, can you tell us about how the Kiwi project got started? As would be well, much. Yeah, um, it's it wasn't Kiwi at the start. It was named PyMT. At the same time as um, what Ashke said about uh, MT4G, we were uh, Thomas Hansen was the initial creator of the toolkit because he was trying to uh, to make a user interface easily in multi-touch, and he didn't find anything that works for him. All this current solution was was not working with uh, with multi touch concept. It's like UT GTK. It was not even started. There is not even multi touch event on Linux. It was before everything. Uh, the tablet was not something you are you were using. So he started the toolkit, and at like three four months after. I was having the same issues, uh, troubling, uh, having issue to find a good toolkit about it. And until I see the Linux FR option, see about Python, starting to play with it, and then I just found uh, a Google code uh, with PyMT on it. I joined to, uh, I asked Thomas to join the project, uh, and it was very welcoming. We did a lot of cleanups. Uh, we have been able to join the Google Summer of Code via the Enui group because we were far on it. And we have been able to meet uh, from now at least one time per year. And at then, when PMT was quite of trade, um, Android was growing a lot and at some point we, we were first we were forced to rethink the toolkit 
to be able to be more performance and to have a graphic stack stack that works on mobiles because uh, all we were using the all of the GL function etc it, it absolutely doesn't work on mobile so we did like three iteration before getting TV the way it is currently and all has happened in a week in US where at his uh, parent house alone in one week and we just think about what we want and really didn't check uh, what the other were doing. Just think what we like, how we would like to do it and we were brainstorming the whole day and we invented like the Kiwi language, we invented um, the way of the input event are working right now, etc. There's a lot of things happened this week. And yeah, since then TV is growing every month. I think it's because uh, it, you were working on this since at least two years, I think, from 2008 to 2010. And then uh, when you decided to, to rework everything, you had a lot of stuff in mind that you wanted to change. And you had a lot, of, a lot to experiment at this a point. A lot to experiment. But, yeah. for example, the Kiwi language, I, at this time, I didn't even knew about QML of yeah. Qt. I heard about it a few months after. And yes, we are very similar, even if they are far more powerful than us. Uh, and... It's it's really like a brainstorming. We try to write it in a way like we tried YAML and it just didn't work. We try a lot of other language like what about XML? Even in PyMT, we were being able to build a whole UI and attach events in XML. It was working, but well, doesn't please us. Yeah, nobody likes XML. <laughs> <laughs> but it's yeah. something that happened. Yeah. Right. Well, I mean, it, it kind of makes sense in a way, right? If you're thinking in terms of what's the most elegant way to express a user interface and other projects have done that at various points in times, right? And inevitably, when they choose that, nobody's happy with it. But you guys just had the foresight to say, we're not happy with it and we're going to go a completely different direction. And we're certainly glad you did. And and this is something that drives us from the start, actually, because we never think about how the other were doing. Otherwise, we will fall into the same issues. Yeah. Uh, if you think about GTK and QT, the so way they build UIs, the so way they use events, uh, it's the event historic. And we were mm. being able to just create from the start what would be a modern way. But I guess if we were doing it again right now, we might just came up with a different solution, a different way to do things. Yes. So, so this kind of leads really well into the next question. What mm -hmm. made you folks choose Python as the basis for Kibi? I don't have a real answer about it. <laughs> it's just Python? the language of meta, that makes sense. That's all, I think. It was the right language at the right yeah. time. Yeah, I think you... You 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 had used uh, Python for some time before. You had tried a lot of technology, and if you did that in Python, it was yeah maybe ah uh, yeah you, you said earlier because you 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 wanted uh, something different than C, from C. So I guess uh, that's that's yeah. also. I was starting a project called Noya, and it was um, a software when you can put well. Actually, it's kind of uh, what you are doing on your day job, um, Gabriel. It's putting objects on the table and okay, playing yeah. music with it. Yeah. And I was I was needed a simple things, having mm. a possibility to have buttons and labels mm. in OpenGL. Yeah. There is absolutely no good solution for it. At least a, a solution that looks good and when you can do everything and easy mm. to use. I was mm. starting to write it in C++. Mm. And I'm spending so much time on it. This is how I discovered Python PNT and you know the rest of the story. Mm. Just mm -hmm. as I say, it came up at the right time. So, but, so but, oh, JavaScript. but we don't know why Thomas cho chose the Python. No, and he's not here. 
He's not here. He's <laughs> lost in the sands of time. Yeah, I lost. His toe is lost. Okay. Alright. Um, honestly, just, guys, Python mm-hmm. is at least a language that uh, gives you time to focus on issues, not on the mm-hmm. language itself. Right. Yeah, you are not what, really dealing mm-hmm. with the language. That's Always what, dealing that's with what the language. That's what I love too, yeah. Yeah, yeah me too. I forgot about it. You just sometimes say, oh, I love Python because <laughs> you, you just gain so much time of doing things that on other language you will spend a lot more. Yeah. Well, that's one of the things that makes Kivi so enjoyable to work with, right? Is because the language, as you said, it, it kind of allows you to be so expressive and it kind of stays out of the way and you can think in very high level abstract terms. Mm. I haven't had a lot, a, a lot of time to play with Kivi, but I was very impressed when I was doing the prep for this episode, how I was able to sort of like download Kibi, download the tutorial, and it's like, hey, I'm actually assembling, you know, a UI on the screen with widgets and mm-hmm. labels, and and it's, it all just kind of works and is very straightforward, and like, it's not like you mentioned some of these other UI paradigms like uh, um, uh, Qt or, or GTK, mm-hmm. where there's this whole huge like conceptual framework that you have to wrap your head around before mm. you can make anything happen on the screen, I, I think I think it's awesome that you guys did do choose Python, and also it's a testament to your good design that using Kivi is just such a pleasure to pick up and run with. Well, so, some people we have your concept in Kivi too, but you have to to learn. But and some some people struggle more than others to to get them. But it's yeah. easy once you you got them. It's easy to forget about it because they fit your mind really well, I think. But so we, we try to, to, to improve the documentation uh, because for some people it's more important for, than for others. But uh, I, I do think the concepts are good. They, they may need better explanations sometimes, but I agree they are good. So what were some of the major influences and inspirations for the way that Kibi was implemented? Or was it all just happy accident? <laughs> Definitely a few happy accidents, I guess. Um, uh, at least the Kiwi language is an happy accident. Yep. Um. The, but the event system is more uh, traditional, I guess, I, I would say. The, the, way the event system, yes, not yeah. the input one. Mm, okay. Um, so in Kiwi, we have all the inputs are... are the same but separated. It's like you have the same base class, uh, and it's not really subclass. It's like uh, to be simple, you have a touch event, and in the touch, you know what the touch is capable of. So mm, yeah. on the, the pro- documentation, we have um, the profile. Uh, yeah, there is a profile. Like the profile said, your touch is able to support a 2D position, a 3D position, is supporting um, a 2D pressure, or etc. So, and for each profile, you have a set of attributes that is added to the original touch class. So it's kind of, um, it's making the input completely abstract because it works on touchpad, but it can work also on um, a table with camera behind when mm. he is able to detect the pressure or the shape of your finger. This mm. is information that you can receive and use it, or it can just work with a, a simple cursor. And mm. we tried also to use, uh, I have been able in the leap motion uh, beta developer, so I received the, uh, no, no, even before the, be, before the beta, I received a, uh, uh, or leap motion device, uh, device. device. Yes. Yeah. And it, it was quite nice to, to try uh, using it. We, we were almost being able to use it directly in Kiwi. Just a little bit of wrapper and it was done. And the same for Kinect. And you cannot do that with other toolkit, honestly. Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, in Kiwi, you can just draw a little bit of provider and all your widget will be able to to use it because also one of the big things in Kiwi is every widget we've wrote is built on the 
touch events and the touch by design there, is, there can be multiple ones mm. so you always think about it mean, meaning you can press two buttons at the same time on a Kiwi application you cannot do that on other applications GDK, QT, or even the web, it's not made of. Mm. If you create two buttons on a form, you cannot press at the same time. You can do yeah. it in Kiwi, and it's opening a lot of uh, multi-user uh, application. Mm-hmm. You, you mentioned uh, the conception of widgets, and, and that's what I uh, something that I really appreciate in, in Kiwi. Uh, when you are doing uh, Python and using, for example, GTK or Qt or other frameworks that are wrappers of C++ libraries, and you 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 don't have access to the underlying uh, layer, you can't extend things the way you want. And when you are working in a library that is built in the language you are using, and especially in a as dynamic a language as Python, you are free to extend about uh, anything and you, you can plug your parts just the, the way you want and I think it's uh, a freedom that you, you rarely have uh, even because for example if you extend the C++ program you don't have as much freedom to tinker with the with the elements of the framework as uh, as in Python because things can be closed th- things can be can be Built and you you aren't, you aren't supposed to integrate too much with the framework. In Python, you have quite a lot of power at this level, and I think uh, it's more like yeah being on the shoulder of a giant, which is uh, Python, and uh, having the the feature at the, at the right level, uh, just uh, so you can grab them. And uh, for for the the touch system uh, and just like over the things, it's a, a bit of a um, uh, foreign to the to the object uh, oriented uh, philosophy. So that instead of putting classes on on things, you have one class. But even if you have multiple classes to to describe your events, it's not the object model which shows what uh, the event is. It's the data inside, and that's I, I think it's indeed quite quite a good idea. Quite a powerful uh, yeah. abstraction. Uh, abstraction, yes, perfect, <laughs> perfect. Uh, uh, but I, I guess that's a bit, a bit like duct typing, but for for events, it's uh, if it asks something, you are you can use it this way. So to to answer to the question is like the influence of our inspiration on the Kiwi design. It's like Python itself. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That is very cool. It's like it's like not only is Kivi written in Python, but it's also designed to be Pythonic in nature. Uh, it's a concept because I'm, what is Pythonic? When you start Python, you you read a lot about being Pythonic. This is Pythonic. This is not. Where's the definition of that? There's absolutely no documentation saying this is. Something well, that looks great in Python, this is not. <laughs> so at the time of writing Kiwi on Python, there is the, the Zen of no. Python. But uh, there was a, a great uh, conference about this uh, in the in the last PyCon that I watched on on YouTube uh, last week. It was the explaining the difference between writing uh, Pep8 compatible code and writing Pythonic Pythonic code, and it was very very interesting. So I think I don't remember yeah. who, who did it, but it was really great. Yeah, it was so. Raymond Hedinger. I, I mm-hmm. was there for that talk, and he definitely did a very good job of that. So uh, we'll, we'll certainly add a link to that in the show notes so that other people can watch it. Because it was great. It really get, did give a very good concrete example of mm. what is Pythonic and what is not. Because like you, I've, when I first started learning Python, I kept coming across these references of Pythonic versus non-Pythonic code and it's very subjective and there doesn't really seem mm. to be any firm conclusion as to what really makes something Pythonic. It's more just the way that it feels when you're dealing with it. So yeah, he really did a great job of distilling it down to its essence. So speaking of distilling things down to their essence, one of the amazing things about Kivi is that it's, 
comparatively simple to learn. I mean, I understand that there are some concepts that you have to wrap your head around, but as I said to you, you know, I, I was able to sort of at least pick up the rudiments of it and, and if not run with it, then, then walk with it with in a matter of a couple of hours. And that yeah. hasn't been my experience with various other UI frameworks that I've attempted to use like Qt or, you know, I remember getting pretty frustrated with, with Tickle TK back in the day. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So how did you folks make, how did you folks come up with a design um, that embodies this ease of use? I, I can only imagine it was, it was on purpose. It can't have been just a happy accident, can it? I, I think what uh, Mathieu described uh, earlier, it's, uh, and some, something I try to do uh, sometime too, is to, to say, okay, forget about or, or technically things can be done, but what would I want to use? It's like a uh, design-driven development. You, you say, okay, I want to use something like this. Let's, let's imagine it's possible. And then, we, then, uh, then you, you, you write the code that you would want to write, and uh, then you can you try to make it happen. And so you just put some some code. What would, would it be would it be nice if this code worked this way? Just and I think that's something very Pythonic. But when when I write Python, something some a lot of time I don't have to look at the documentation. I I say what if if it worked this way? That would be that would just be nice. And you write it, and it works. And that's, I think, what's the pleasure of Python is that things just come naturally. You don't have to, to, to check. The people thought a lot, a lot of time about how, uh, what would be the most natural way to do one thing. And you can come up with it and be right 90% of the time. And I think building the, the API this way is just the, 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 what I would call Called Pythonic, so you you can just avoid uh, uh, experiment, experimenting with API even before building it. I f I think it's the key for this. This is what my experience has been with KV in terms of designing. What we generally do is first of all look into how it's been done in other interfaces. For example, let's see how something is implemented in Android or in GTK or in QD. But after that, after first looking into how it's done in other places, we generally tend to ask ourselves, how would it be more intuitive? How would it be simpler? And how can it be made in such a way that it can be, you know, just something that clicks into your mind and something that you can just uh, write down without having to look at the documentation. And generally... If you, what we do normally try to do is pass everything to Tito or Matthew, for that matter, and that's what is uh, on IRC we call him Tito. So he generally makes it very simple and lays it out how it should generally be. And he has an art for it for making things as simple as possible. So even if uh, the rest of us miss it, if it goes through him, it's simplified to such a uh, such a place that. It's you know, it just becomes very simple, very straightforward for anyone to use. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Have some pros. <laughs> so, what are some of the biggest challenges that you have experienced in building Kibi, both you know, either early on or most recently, some of the biggest challenges that you've come across, whether it's in the design or the actual development or maybe in uh, making it making it performant enough. I think performance is definitely the biggest one there. The biggest yeah. challenge. It's really hard to get everything to work the right way and get it all fast and everything, especially when you get onto these mobile devices where we're kind of almost trying to put a square peg in a round hole by putting Python on these Java-based yeah. Android devices. But really, I think that's the, the biggest challenge is just getting it to work and be fast, getting that native speed. Yep. And on desktop, it's pretty good most of the time, but on the on the, the mobile devices, it's a little harder. I bet. I mean, to me, that's that was one of the things that really 
blew my socks off about Kivi is that this one toolkit works so well on the desktop, on mobile phones, on mobile tablets. I mean, that is an achievement unto itself. And you compare it to Java, where Java is really all about being heavily multi-threaded. And that's what these devices are made to do, is these heavily multi-threaded applications, and we have this Python application that's stuck in one thread. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. uh, and yeah. on it, I have a word about it. Evan, if, I, I talk uh, the kiddo about it uh, two years ago, but still, all the current solutions that is going on the community, like PyPy, uh, it's not going to work for us in mobile. Okay, they have a good solution that works, that will work only on desktop. Uh, if you want to do mobile development, this is not how you need to think. And I'm very, very, very sad to to see that there is absolutely uh, no consideration about mobile development in the Python community, except for us. It's like three weeks ago, or yes, three weeks ago, I got an invitation to be part of the language sum, uh, summit uh, on PyCon mm -hmm. and because they wanted to talk about the uh, mobile power in the end there is absolutely no discussion about it still there is so much thing to do on the language itself can you imagine like right now to be able to support Android we still need to patch Pythons to be able to cross compile it this is not something that is supported from the start mm -hmm. in the language so wow. it can it might not be something that you can understand or, or or realize, but for me, having a longer language that I need to patch to change to be able to support a new platform like Android and it's look like Linux or being able to to compile for ERM from my desktop doesn't look great. Like I'm you. And this is one of the steps. There's so many other steps. And then fixing the GIL. A lot of uh, Evan Guido say it's not an issue, etc. We on Android there is no multiprocessing, and you will never be able to use it because this is not how the uh, yeah they, they don't want it. They they don't want. I, I tried. To, I spent uh, an hellish week trying to make it work uh, like two years ago, and and uh, in the end I understood that it it wouldn't work because the uh, uh, a system feature that is lacking, and the uh, Android dev don't want it into because that would that could be a performance problem. So there is there is just no way for for friends yes, so to communicate and uh, and to and to to do what what's needed for multiprocessing. So you just can't have it. So you have to find other solution indeed. And we have services to 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 delay to put tasks in in the background, but it's clearly not enough. We are we have to this find this is not this is absolutely not enough. Let's say you have a request, uh, you are doing some, I don't, you you are loading images in mm. synchronously, okay. So you are putting time uh, for getting your data from the web. Um, Decoding it, the PNG into RGBA, uploading it into the GPU, etc. There is one part we can make it a little bit faster with, with threads. But because it's threads and it's a, a mm. Python threads, it's the same as having just a callback in a clock on your main thread. It's, it's actually worse. Or threads just, they are just good to, to avoid blocking the UI, but they and won't make anything faster. Uh, except yeah. if you are able to to release the gil, but you have to go very low level for that. So, it's no, and you have to. It's very limited. You can't do a lot without the gil. So. Yes, and I don't. So, if anybody remember about the the project, I heard about an, somebody is trying to solve that by starting one interpreter for each core. Mm. Okay. And he is able to move object, Python object, from one interpreter to another. Uh, I, don't, I didn't know about this. And so, in that way, you might be able to do some work on one interpreter, completely separated on one core, but in the same process. And when you're done with it, you can put an obje uh, the object on the queue and get it on the first thread without any cost, without any jail. That would be awesome if it actually work on mobile. 
yeah. can so be a solution it, for us. It sounds like to me, it, it, you know, it's really interesting hearing you guys talk about that. I, it, I've kind of, I was a Ruby person before I was a Python person. I've been into Python now for four or five months, and I, I saw many of the same discussions over there. Like, you know, it seems like the old school dynamic languages are all kind of struggling with these same issues. They don't really transition very well to mobile platforms and they don't really have a good concurrency story. They really don't do threading very well. Anyway, it seems like, it seems like hope, you know, there, there should be like either a new generation of, of these languages or maybe some new language that supports these paradigms out of the box. Yeah. If you, if you... If you want to support multiple cores and to, to be able to, to transition to share memory uh, uh, this way, yeah, uh, very dynamic languages are, are, are not really able to, to help. So uh, not yet. Maybe there is some discussion. Absolutely. So if you folks were to start the project over, what would you do differently? First of all, if you don't mind, I'd like to mention one thing. Okay, one advantage of Kiwi on uh, on uh, mobile essentially is that the whole UI is based on OpenGL. I don't think we talked about that, but because of that, essentially what happens is, you, uh, you know, anything that is based on graphics is essentially very fast. And mm -hmm. if you really yep. want to do do some shaders and stuff like that, that part is not bogged down by anything. So yeah. that is one of the advantages that is, you know. Uh, not available in other uh, languages. We in Kiwi, uh, shaders and uh, effects uh, that use shaders are made very easy. Inclement uh, Alexander Taylor he did a, did an effect widget, and pre even before that, using shaders was pretty easy in Kiwi. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in that sense, on mobiles, many things can be made very easy. So, if you were let's say doing anything related to op uh, OpenGL or uh, graphics directly, that wouldn't mm. be bogged down. But you, you, it's this is one example of the design we choose. It's like not showing OpenGL to the users, and even if if it's not fully complete, like there is still a lot of a room for improvement here. But still, we have simple class that you can just use it to build your graphics and all the OpenGL is optimized and done in the background. It's completely transparent and this is what is making TV on the graphic fast. Even if some people are making even faster with new project, still the, the initial solution is quite better than the, the other one you can and and it it's it's actually a pretty thin wrapper. It's not very yes. hard to to go around it and to to poke at the low level. And uh, there's I think that that's something that's uh, quite a success too in the in the design that you you can you you can easily use very advanced features like stencil or 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 to do touching uh, graphics uh, textures or making them wrap. Uh, or mo modifying, uh, uh, ch 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 building mesh, mesh, uh, or, or things like this, and but it's very, very easy to, to do the same thing in raw OpenGL uh, would be like, uh, well, it's a nightmare for for simple-minded people like me. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but about, about performances, uh, yeah, the, the graphic part is 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 very really great. It's not not the issue. You can you can do a lot if you manage to 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 be careful about the important parts. It you can do a lot because you have all the full power of the of the GPU. Uh, GPU. Uh, what's hard if, is if you have number crunching or a lot of uh, AV operations to do in the background. So that's that's oh. a bit a bit harder. Yeah, mo most of the time, this is your code or your Python that will make give this, um, the application slow. Mm. Uh, if you are building a new UI with uh, 1,000 widgets, you might have an issue uh, with it on mobile. Instead, if you are able to write one widget that can manage the 100 behind, let's say if the 100 were... Um, uh, blocks on uh, 2D games, I don't know, uh, or a maze, uh, 
so you can find a way to manage it yourself, not using the Kiwi widget. Then you <coughs> will um, execute less Python, and the graphic part will just follow you as you want. Yeah, I think that's what uh, Kovac is, is put, uh, pushing a lot on Kivant yes. uh, to, to, to do the for yeah, game yeah. development. There's still a lot of work on it, but it's very promising for heavy game development with Kiwi. It's a game further to Kiwi, yes. It's a very good project. <laughs> to answer the question on uh, what we would change in the project uh, if we were to start it from uh, scratch today, I think mm. we already discussed about this. Uh, we were essentially looking for changes that we need to do in a major uh, release, let's say, so something mm -hmm. like 2.0. And for that, we discussed on things like this. Essentially, one of the major drawbacks, as we discussed earlier, is the concurrency. So I would hope we would be somehow able to solve that issue, because that is one of the major issues, mm. considering even uh, your smartwatch is going to have multiple cores, Python should be able to take advantage of that. Uh, about that, just... One word is I was talking about it on uh, earlier on IRC. It's about React.js, and I read a few things about React uh, Native. Mm -hmm. So it's a project from Facebook that JavaScript is driving new UI, uh, so UI of your application. And the way it works on the native part is like they they have a thread executing the UI. But all the UI is driven from JavaScript on another thread. Okay? If you think about Android, they do the same. They have a new if thread, they have even methods that uh, is right and run on UE thread. So you can, you have your UE thread and you have threads uh, around it that can control and push things into your UI. This is something we completely miss in Kili by design. And our, um, the biggest thing is because we are using OpenGL and OpenGL requires you to execute all the commands in the main thread. If you think about shared context, etc., we can't go this way because uh, we have a lot of platform to support and means we cannot just use it. So we are stuck with this approach right now and we we would need to redesign it from scratch. I completely agree with HK. It's like maybe trying to find a way of having a thread just displaying the UI and focus mm -hmm. on that, loading the, the images, doing all the OpenGL, and then having your main thread driving it. We might get better performance, but again, you cannot assume it unless you have an experiment about it. Yeah, but would it be hard? Currently, for example, to say okay, uh, I I put every every everything in, in all, all my logic in a separate thread, and I only uh, everything that will change uh, a property that affect uh, uh, a widget is like yes. call call uh, call later uh, call schedule schedule once. Would would it would, you think it would be a lot of work? It will be a lot of work. Yeah. Okay. So what are some of the most interesting or strange things that you've seen Kivi used for? I think the coolest thing I've seen Kivi used for is what Gabrielle works on at work. That object <laughs> is that. <laughs> That's just yeah. really cool. <laughs> well, if, if you want, well, I, I can... Thanks a lot for, for the props. Yeah, <laughs> I'll, so I, I'll explain a little for, for people. So we are... I, I, I may be a, a bit... Uh, Unusual because I'm one of the people not using currently Kiwi for mobile or pl platforms. I'm using it on big tables, uh, like a giant iPad from like 40 to 80 uh, inches uh, diagonal. Uh, so, so we are, we are putting uh, Kiwi, Kiwi application on, on, on these tables and uh, we are using uh, the, the, the point that uh, objects uh, do, do uh, by when we put them on the table and uh, to, to detect the features and uh, this way we, we, we check that uh, the, the ID of the object and you, we use the protocol TUIO to send uh, 
the, the, this data uh, to other applications. So this way we can build uh, application that make use of objects. And uh, this is all done in Kiwi. So it's quite cool, I admit. <laughs> but uh, I, I've, I've seen a lot of cool things done, done with Kiwi. Uh, and uh, things I, I didn't have an idea that people will do. There's a project that is using Kiwi for for um, commanding, uh, sending commands to, to telemetry equipment for for um, cars uh, and uh, prototypes uh, testing. We are Kiwi being used uh, for educational games for uh, for children. We are Kiwi, there is Kiwi used in uh, 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 medical equipment uh, for in, uh, on. On Android, uh, Android applications uh, uh, for for pharma pharmaceutics or every industry. It, it's quite cool to see Kiwi used uh, in all sorts of places like this. So the, yeah. I think what's quite cool about it is that the framework doesn't force you in a direct direction. You can you can take it and build what you what you want with it. So it's it's very interesting. Yeah, very cool. Steve. The framework is really um, a toolbox for the developer. You can use it just while making buttons, inputs, scroll, view, etc. Or you can do a complete custom UI and then it's the artist inside you that is speaking. You can do anything with it. Neat. Gabrielle, do you think you'd be willing to, sh or can you, I don't know if your work will allow, but... Uh, if you can, maybe put a link to, to anything that's that's out there about your work project with the big table. Of, and, um, of you know. course, <laughs> of course, my work will allow. <laughs> yeah, oh, cool. I, I put a, I'll put a, put a link so people can check what we do, and uh, yeah, if, that's, if they enjoy it, that would be great. Okay, one of the coolest things that I've ever seen Kiwi being used for was done by Matthew. Now he used it for an interactive movie. What oh, it was, yeah, um, yeah, it was a project last year, Digital Stories. Um, I was contracted to be able to to make a system for displaying movies okay, on the theaters, and a lot of people in the rules were having lasers, and they was able to point out something on the movies. Okay, so we have an infrared camera that is looking on the screen and we are able to analyze them and put it back into the movies. So there is multiple movies. One is, like say, it's a boy who is trying to lay a girl, but he wants to show it's the best boy ever. So every step is trying to do something like drinking the beer faster than his friends and to drink the beer faster all the audience uh, must put the pointer on the pier of the heroes and move the pointer as fast as possible until <laughs> there is no more beer, okay? And then he gains some points, and there is another game when the audience must follow a shape, and the shape is starting to shrink more and more and more, and if there is too much pointer of size or shape, then he lost, or if all the Indians stay in the shape, he win, etc. So you get the idea. And at the end, you have uh, an amount of points, and depending on the points, uh, the plot is not the same at the end. Um, this is one one usage of Kiwi really, yeah, really fun and interesting to explore. I don't suppose by any chance you have a link to that that you can share? Yes. Excellent. That'd be great. So, what are some of the changes and features that you're particularly excited about in the future of Kiwi? I think a big thing is going to be getting in some multi-language support, allowing right-to-left text and reshaping of some of these uh, Eastern scripts where a character looks different when it's next to a certain character and just opening up Kivi to more people in that way yeah. so they can work in their language. Well, that's, true. Yeah, but that's another ch interesting challenge because a lot of uh, the text is actually quite complicated to display and we're doing everything in the, 
in OpenGL means we have a lot of the burden uh, on us. So, but uh, thankfully there are some li libraries we can make use of, but it's still quite some work. And even the standard solutions like Harfbuzz, there's virtually no documentation for it. You just have to go and find examples, look at other people's code. That's really all there is available for it. So. In terms of features, we were essentially looking to, you know, change everything we can in terms of next we're looking forward to a 2.0 release. So hopefully uh, we'll have a dot releases before that, but for 2.0 release, hopefully we can fix almost as many issues that we have, essentially for multi-threading and extra, uh, other things like that. And one other thing that we didn't talk about was UI. Right now, the widget sets that we have were generally started as something that was geared, geared towards desktops. They weren't really started from the ground up thinking mobile in mind. So one of the things that I'd like to see come up next is widgets that are designed keeping in mind mobile and they're speedy and fast performance on mobiles. Yeah, and integration in, in platform specific UIs, it's something that people ask quite a lot. Even if these days people use Thames a lot more, a lot more, like thankfully, uh, thanks to Google Material UI, they understand that they can design the UI in the way they want, and Kiwi gives a lot of freedom for that. So they, they I think they, me, they, there may be less demand for it in the future. But even on desktop, for example, being able to integrate more in the in the UI the user is used to, uh, maybe an impo important step to, to do. And even using, uh, for example, shortcuts or accessibility features, uh, there's, there's quite a lot to, to do. And uh, I, I think something to note is that Kiwi historically has not been developed with a long uh, roadmap. It was like, uh, oh, I need some, I need this. Let's try to add it and see how it works. And uh, thinking the design, but one step at a time. And so we are, there's not a, a lot of long-term features that we are planning, but and we, we we try to do that for 2.0, as as was said before. But uh, so we have a wiki page about this. So if people are interested, um, we we'll, we'll try to we'll put a link on that. Absolutely. Uh, no. Maybe just um, I would like to talk about one thing uh, about it. It's like even if the podcast is about Kiwi, Kiwi is just one piece of all the project that we as core developer are managing. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like we uh, are doing Python for Android. It's a separate project. That is, uh, is being able to comp you can compile Python and some of the Python extension on Android. So s most of the time you need to patch the extension if you want to be able to compile it. We have exactly the same for uh, iOS. It's not Python for iOS because it is a separate project and application. So we call it Kiwi iOS. We also manage. Uh, we invented actually because there is no good project about it. Um, a library to use the native language of the platform directly from Python. For example, if you want to touch some of the Java API on Android, uh, before it was very complex to get it. It's like you need to wrote a genie um, of wrapper that we call you Java, and the genie you re, uh, wrap it into a Python extension, and then you can use it. Let's say. Uh, there is absolutely no contribution on this part. Then we invented PyGenius. So because Java, you can instruct back, uh, instruct back. Oh, I introspect, don't... introspect. Introspect it. Um, then we build PyGenius that just use the power of the Java language to be able to do the duck typing as you would do on the Java. And you can call directly methods that even if you didn't import them, this is very cool because we have also another project called the Kiwi Remote Shell. You just start the Kiwi application on your mobile. 
it gives you an SSH uh, server. Then you can connect onto it, and you have a Python console where you can start to import PyGenius and test the Android APIs in lives. Uh, you can create an Android widget in Python and add it to your uh, GV application, etc. This is something cool. We don't have the same for iOS, but it can be completely durable. And the same for we do for PyGenius, we do the same for iOS uh, with Objective C, and it's called PyGenius. So as you can see, Kiwi is only the UI part, but to be able to execute mm. it and allow the user to use the feature on your phone, we have also a lot of other tools. I miss the one most important one is mm. Player, and Player is also a good invention because we build all the first step, so the toolchain. Then the PyGenius and PyGenius is like the wrapper to be able to, to call the language, the destination language, Java or Objective-C. Now we have player and it will abstract all the, the features of, yeah, platform specific features. Like if you want to access to the GPS, uh, you don't want to write a specific code for Android and iOS and other platforms. So we have just um, a facade, as we called, and we have different F implementation uh, per platform. And we have that for a lot of things. Uh, that's it. So currently, this is that. The future of Kiwi, it's bad that the question is only for the Kiwi because mm. we did a lot uh, outside Kiwi and we have also a card to play on that. As you say, Gabriel, um, people were asking about is there a way to make, uh, to create native interface in Python? And there is absolutely no good alternative uh, today. And we have all the tools to build a new library, not Kiwi, because doesn't work the same, and I'm not sure we could do it with uh, with it. But if we will start from scratch, like Ionic did, uh, it's we have all the tools for it. It might be one of the future of the, a new Python library. Yeah, because we are trying to, to cover a lot of use cases, and maybe some of it them are not covered. Uh, correctly in uh, or can't be correctly covered in, in HTML rendering. So, yeah, we yeah this is actually a very very bad uh, bad thing wait, to, wait. to try with Kiwi. Yeah, yeah. Kiwi have no tool to be able to do HTML rendering, and we will mm. not be able to provide not soon not in the future because it's a very big things to have in OpenGL. This is also our our core issues. It's it's a big point for us, and this is where all the performance is going on. But because we're in OpenGL, try to find a library that works. You can try WebKit directly. It's just a mess. And there is a project around it that's trying to do it. And it's not going to work on mobile soon either. And Except if you want dependencies that cost you, I don't remember how much, 50 megabytes, let's say. Mm. Maybe even more. Yeah, but uh, one of the things is that we, we we did effectively uh, 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 the the things are, are separate and uh, Python for Android, Kiwi iOS and uh, Player and PyGenius, everything is separated and can be reused. So indeed, uh, we tried not to put everything in Kiwi and uh, yes. and so. People have to have to understand that if they if they want something in Kiwi, uh, in the the Kiwi ecosystem, and uh, not everything, they can go and work with us anyway. We we are we are, we are open to, to and we we and we are very open for help in the various projects outside of Kiwi. So they, they yeah, can they Genius can come. This is one of the best example. Mm. It's using. Uh, people are using it as an alternative to the current solution that's not working very well and we are very performant on it. So mm. there is a lot of contribution and a lot of fork on this project. Mm. So this is awesome. That's very cool. The Kiwi Remote Shell project in particular sounds really, really neat. I mean, I can just envision people sort of live coding on their mobile devices from their 
the, the, the comfort of their laptop, it sounds really, really nifty. Yeah. Yes. Uh, except it's just yes. for testing. You don't, you have no way to save what you did. Just a shell, so but it could, it could be improved. It's just a, yes, a, a, a shell, but it, it could be improved. Remember that we are very few active contributors. Mm. Uh, we and the community is growing, in my point of view, very fast, and we are not a lot to handle everything. We are we are getting so much backlog. Yeah, it's a lot, unbelievable. A lot more new users than new new contributors, but yeah, <laughs> that's and a, maybe that's this is something that can kill us because if you are not be able to answer everything and letting all the things goes by itself, it's not good. But oh, what can we do at? Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. one of the last questions that we have here, I'll save, I'll save it for that. But maybe we can, maybe we can help with that. Mm -hmm. That would be, be great. Um, so yeah, before we get to that last question, just one more, wondering if there are any new platforms or operating systems that you are looking to add support for, such as the Sailfish OS from Jala or the new Ubuntu phone uh, operating system. I've been wanting to 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 uh, to help Ubuntu the Ubuntu support, but I've I've had a few look at it and tried uh, when we are we were adding SDL because that was a path to for it, but I, I didn't find the time in the last six months to to work on it. So if anybody is interested, that would be cool. I'm pretty sure Firefox OS won't be possible, but uh, <laughs> I because. <laughs> Don't say impossible. <laughs> well, it would be, but if, if somebody is able to do it, that would be great. But I don't think the Mozilla people would be happy with this. But, well, <laughs> if you have an idea, I, 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 I wouldn't say impossible for you, okay, <laughs> but. Uh, <laughs> I think it's a question of practicality on Firefox OS. The specs of the base phones are so low that right now, I think it's not practical. Mm. Yeah, it's very, very the the cheap uh, the cheap uh, Firefox phone is quite low uh, spec low, low spec. Yeah. Very cool. So now here is that question that I mentioned previously. This is your opportunity to to rally support to your cause. Is there hmm. anything in particular that you would like to ask our listeners to help with? It can be something as simple as you know you guys need help fixing some documentation problems or help dealing with the backlog or whatever like how can how can our listeners help uh, because Kivi is an awesome project and it deserves it deserves to be supported well probably the um, best way is just people get out there start using it start figuring out you know what do they like about it what do they not like what could be improved upon it the feedback helps a lot um, there's always room for help in the documentation and examples, especially. We get a lot of people complaining there's not enough examples of how to do things. Yeah, there are a lot of things that they can try to reproduce bugs. If they, they see something, uh, maybe some bugs have been resolved and not fixed and not marked as fixed. Or if uh, somebody pushed a, a, a pull request and that nobody found the time to test it, mm -hmm. they can say, oh, it works for me too. But that's a lot of help for us because we have confidence that it, uh, we, can, we can check it and, uh, and uh, it will probably be a, a good work to, to merge. And uh, yeah, giving feedbacks, there, there is a lot of work on the documentation. Uh, already, but it's a, a big, big, big documentation. So it's always great to 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 have a look and see maybe things have been uh, changed or they they need improvements. That's a, that's always great to 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 look. And uh, anyway, I'm sure a lot of people use TV and are not sure if they can help, and uh, they they just have to know. But uh, we are very welcoming to to the help. We don't always have the time to react. Uh, immediately, to but uh, we we try. Yeah, and like you add this thing. Now, GSOC selection for students just ended, and there'll be a lot of students that didn't get through. I'd like to tell them, you know, they shouldn't just wait for GSOC. If they really want to go forward, mm. they should just go ahead and choose a project of their liking. 
let's say maybe like hey we just go there start contributing to it even if you weren't selected for the SOC just continue mm. working on the project that you're interested in and you know just start small start with some simple documentation fixes in fact not this is not just for students for anyone who's interested in helping out you we really need a lot of people helping out and if you can just start small uh, just add some simple documentation fixes and GID Hub it makes it very easy all you have to do is create a login uh, open a web form just look at the documentation we feel even if it's just as simple as you know uh, English correction or grammar correction just go ahead and do it online and then submit all you have to do is click on a submit button and a new PR is submitted that's it that's how easy it is to get in now once you yeah. get in and for people who are already aware of uh, they're a bit more advanced and can get into other stuff you know slowly either either gradually increase your commitment level or if you are comfortable straight away go do the number of open issues on GID Hub and see what you can work at mm-hmm. and I'm mentioning this in terms of GSOC because you know contributing to any open source project helps it helps not only the open source project itself but it also helps you the contributor in terms of adding to your portfolio and right now open source is a very good way to add to your portfolio a lot of the major companies are looking for experience people experience with open source absolutely I think it's no accident that uh, LinkedIn now has a very prominent place in your LinkedIn profile to add your github repository mm-hmm. yeah oh could I miss that <laughs> I have two things to add about it. It's like you guys asking for that we are open to all the contribution. It's almost the case for everybody. A um, lot of open source projects, right? What you are really missing is people that are able to each time ever step back about the feedback of, of others and, and giving us a good solution for, for it. Because we have so much backlog that even if we have a lot, a lot of more contribution, if it's documentation issues, most of the time is merged right away because we are always great. But when you, when people are starting just to ask a little bit of question and then when we have to talk about it, it's taking a lot of time for all of us. Um, it would be nice if great people also can contribute us directly with solution or having um, asking to maintain a project like PyGenius or Python for Android, just having a, a look from time to time like uh, seven day per week would be awesome on Python for Android just to answer to other people saying, okay, your recipes on uh, Python for Android is great, you have a few things to change, etc. We, even on the small team, cannot handle so much. Uh, it's already too much, uh, in my point yeah. of view. For so example. we need maintainers, and, uh, and and that's one of the first points. The second point I, I want to raise, if, if somebody in the world would like to sponsor us, even for the KD Association, uh, to be able to buy new hardware, the current one we are using uh, already too much for building our unit test and Matam, another core developer, is trying to use it also for releasing uh, Kiwi Nightlies as a will, will package. Uh, we are able all, only to run Linux Windows when you start to run uh, iOS, um, no, OS X, sorry. Uh, all the server is crashing. We are very limited by the environments we are testing on. And I'm sure if we have a uh, better hardware, we will be able to do the nightlies. Uh, Madame would be very happy to push all of it uh, in it. There is Kiwi iOS when I want to do the nightlies, but there is no hardware for it. And at some point, we need also to increase our unit test coverage. 
this is very very low. Every time we move something on the code, even in Python for Android on Kiwi, it will it might have an impact somewhere else, and we don't see it. We see it only because a user is reporting us uh, an issue or. We, as core developer, are using a part where we're compiling master and then it breaks. This is not cool. This is something that can be seen before that. And this is a critical point of the project. Uh, there is a lot of source code, a lot of widget we need to maintain. We are f uh, looking forward, uh, forward to the version 2. And we don't have the tool to be able to do it in a, in a clean way, I would to say. So yeah. talking about increasing unit test coverage, it strikes me that that might be a tricky thing for people who say, I want to help, I want to dive in, right? Because in order to test, write tests for code, you have to have a really solid understanding of how it works and what you're testing. Um, nope. Not right. necessarily. <laughs> that's, uh, uh, if I can shame in, is that's actually how I started coming, uh, helping Kivi in the very first place because I, I, I found the bug. And I say, okay, uh, I, I just want uh, to, to check if it's really a bug and uh, reduced my, my code to very simple. And when it was simple enough to, to test uh, directly, well, it was nearly a new unit test, so it could be introduced directly in the, in the, in the real library. So just doing a, a little, little test case of a simple bug, it's already uh, quite helpful, actually. If you if you look at a bug report and you generate a, a new uh, a test case for it, it's a it's a very 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 cool contribution. Well, I don't like, I won't like to discourage anyone from use, uh, writing unit ca uh, test case directly. But I think what the uh, Matthew was hinting at was we recently added a, uh, a link on a web page for donation directly. We uh, lack the hardware. And we would definitely love to get some new hardware for testing. And as he said, we need uh, new hardware to be able to, uh, you know, set up nightly packages for testers and stuff like that. We need a lot more uh, influx in terms of money also. So it, the best way would be if someone could hire uh, Matthew directly, I think, for working with QB. <laughs> Full time. No, no. Uh, <laughs> now, on, honestly, at least supporting for that web would be cool. Uh, you don't know about it, guys, but for example, the new reboot of the Kiwi iOS, the new version of the toolchain, uh, it was done to be, to support all the different um, CPU, not only ARM, uh, but also the 64 version and the, um, uh, the emulators. Okay. Mm -hmm. And last week I booked uh, one new iPad to be able to finally test it. But I, I, it's like nobody else will do it and will offer me an iPad. And it's very hard to, to ask that on the internet. I don't know how to do And, well, I don't know how to say. But yes, sponsoring at least uh, the Kiwi project may give us a little more space uh, to buy things and at least maybe put bounties on the biggest issue to be able to make the community participating more on the biggest issue we got. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely a tricky problem, right? Like, I, I'm definitely, and I'm guessing Tobias isn't either... Neither of us are particularly connected with mobile hardware manufacturers. You know, we can certainly, I can certainly contribute some cash, but it's tough. I, I don't, I don't know how to hook you up with those hardware manufacturers. I mean, one thing that I would suggest is, you know, yours is a project that an awful lot of people get an awful lot of value out of. Maybe a way to handle this might be to reach out to the Python community through things like, you know, the Python weekly newsletter or PyCoders or, or that kind of thing to, to basically say, hey, the Kivi project is struggling. We're looking for hardware and we're looking for sponsors to help us get that hardware. I think you might be surprised, you know, people working in these various companies might might see that and be able to help you out. That's a great idea. 
That's definitely a good idea. Now we should take up on it. That probably is a lot to do. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Um, well, we, we like to do, with every episode, we like to do um, picks. These can be anything that you're interested in or like or want to recommend to our listening audience. It can be technology related or, or not. I usually recommend a beer because I like craft beer. <laughs> so, <laughs> Tobias, why don't you get us started? Sure. So, I'm going to keep it short. First pick I'm going to choose is the Zeal offline documentation browser. So, for people who use Mac OS, there's a similar project called Dash, and Zeal is the version of that that will run on Linux. So, it's a way for you to download the documentation for various programming languages and libraries and have access to them when you're not online. So, if you're on a plane and you want to be able to look up a particular Python method, you have it stored right on your laptop. And the next pick that I'll you choose is a comic strip called Commit Strip. It's actually published in French and English, and it's just a daily comic strip that, about the life of developers, and it's usually got some pretty amusing content, so definitely recommend that. So I just want to second your recommendation of Zeal. I, uh, before I, I was made very happy and given a Mac laptop in my current gig, I was working with a Linux, uh, a Linux desktop and a Windows laptop, and uh, I... Um, I had been a huge fan of Dash for years and still am now that I'm back on the Mac, but when I was working in Linux and Windows, Zeal was, was certainly a really excellent analog and, and does the job quite nicely. And, and for anybody who hasn't used this kind of thing before, what's super cool about these things is you can hook them into your IDE or editor of choice, and with the dock all offline and already downloaded and everything, it's like it really is instantly at your fingertips, and, and the way the UI works is really, really kind of nice. I, I highly recommend it. So I'll move on to my picks real quick. And the first pick that I will pick is unshockingly a beer. Uh, um, <laughs> Jack at Jack's Abbey Brewery here in, in Framingham, Massachusetts is a brewery that I'm rather fond of. I haven't yet tried a beer from them that I really disliked. And, uh, and they make a beer called Smoke and Dagger. And it is a really delicious uh, dark beer with a lightly smoky flavor. It's considered to be a Rausch beer, which is not a, a variety that I have a lot of a lot of experience with. But um, it's it's really tasty. It's it's I've tasted some German smoke beers that a friend of mine is into, and you know it was just a little too much for me. It was kind of like falling face first into a camp, uh, uh, you know, the camp, the ashes of a campfire with your mouth open. <laughs> but uh, this, <laughs> exactly. But this one's this one's pretty tasty, uh, dark and malty. I, I highly recommend it. Um, so the next thing I want to recommend is a movie, which for some reason here in the United States, it was slammed by the critics. The critics really didn't like it, and I really don't understand. I think they're on crack because I think it's a really good movie <laughs> and is a story that was well told, well acted, and, and just worth seeing. And that's called A Woman in Gold, or A Woman in Gold, excuse me, there's no A in there. Um, and it's about this woman and her family pre-World War II, um, you know, in, in Austria, uh, when the Nazi Germans were, were sort of taking over, and about what happened to her and her family, and the story of a particular priceless piece of art that used to hang in her household. And I won't say any more than that, I will just say... If you look it up on Rotten Tomatoes or whatever your other favorite movie site is and see it rated low by the critics, ignore it and go see it anyway because I think it's really good. <laughs> um, and the last pick that I have is uh, a um, – excuse me. The last pick that I have is – geez, I lost my last pick. Well then, I guess I'm going to keep it short and leave it at two. <laughs> <laughs> Matthew, what, what kind of picks do you have for us? Um, the first one will be Yataf. Uh, I'm not sure about the pronunciation. Is uh, yet another Python formatter from Google. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's actually a formatter that you, you just fill, uh, you give your Python file and give you a very great Python file with uh, with works with pip8, and it's very this is the most working tools I ever seen 
from all the other ones like Auto Pep 8 or Pep 85, if I remember well. And thanks to this project, I, on some of the projects I'm working on, I just use the tools to clean all the files and then uh, with my student, I can ask them to focus on the code and not on the formatting of Python when they just start to learn Python. So it's a, it's a good tool for me. That was my first pick. My second pick will be a project I'm working on. It's linchinese.com. It's not really related to Python, even if all the project uh, is running on Python and it's built with Flask and Jinja, etc., and very cool HTML5 stuff. In Chinese is a website that you that will bring. Uh, you can learn Chinese uh, in a story. Okay, you will be a little dragon and you will uh, have an ninja, is a cat who will try to help you to, in the world of all the Chinese uh, world. And you will learn uh, vocabulary, grammar, and then uh, talking with your brother as a dialogue. So we are using the latest HTML5 uh, web audio and web speech things to make it happen. It's still in beta. You can ask for a subscription, but we are launching a Kickstarter soon, and every feedback will be welcomed. And one last bit, just because you said beer, I'm sure you, you might never test it. I tested only one time in my life. It's called, uh, la, in French, la Reims Cochon. And so la Reims Cochon is a Belgian beer, and it's made in, um, how do you call, I miss the vocabulary, where the beer is made? A brewery? Brewery, okay. Um, not an automatized one, but um, an old one, very old one. Everything is done by hand. Okay, it's artisanal, it's the word? No. Yes. Yes, that's yes. the word, yeah. Okay, so it's one of the last beer done in artisanal in Belgium. And I have been able to visit it only one time in um, Sunday. And after the visit, uh, in front of the sun, we drink a whole beer. I was completely out of nowhere. I, it was very hard to get back to my house after that. And it's very <laughs> light. Just one. Yes, yeah, just just one, but very, very light, very tasty. It's, doesn't even look like blonde or brown beer, etc. Uh, it's almost uh, water, okay? But on the taste, you feel like it's a beer, very light, very tasteful. I liked it. That's it. Wow, that sounds delicious. Um, if you could, at the end of the show, give us links to that beer and those projects, that would be awesome. Okay. Um, so let's see. Uh, Akshay, you're up. Okay. First thing that I'd like, I'd like to share is essentially mangoes. I'm from India and I love mangoes. And you can try them out. At, in this season, it's the best thing to have. And the second thing I'd like to share is one of the most ridiculous things I've ever seen giving me used for. It was essentially a tic tac toe playing machine being controlled remotely by a Kiwi controller. So <laughs> I had no practical purpose other than essentially just playing tic tac toe with the machine uh, using a controller. That's very cool. Actually, I, I, I'm a huge fan of mangoes, and I don't know about where you are, but here in the United States, this particular season, you get these yellow mangoes, sometimes they're called champagne mangoes. Oh man, those things are so delicious. I've got two yeah. in my kitchen ripening right now. Amazing. Ryan, how about you? All right, well, for my pick, uh, I used to be a smoker, and I have since quit smoking and switched to e-cigarettes. Haven't had an actual cigarette in almost a year now. And so my pick is a flavor, and it is called the Milkman by Vaping Rabbit. It's described as a frosted fruit tart milkshake. So like a milkshake made with pop tarts and it's just it's nice and smooth and delicious and fruity and makes nice big clouds. 
Cool. Yeah, it's funny. E-cigarettes seem like a like uh, like um, a, a trend these days. I I nicotine has never been my my drug of choice, but uh, but uh, it's I was at ChefCon for a few weeks ago, and it was just amazing to me how many people had these things out and were using them. It's uh, it's it's really quite a quite a thing. So Gabrielle, what picks do you have for us? Uh, well, I have two picks, and uh, one, the first one is the technology, as you, as you suggested. And uh, I, I'm using a, a, a Windows Manager that I don't think a lot of people use, but I think it's the best thing in the world, so I would <laughs> un encourage uh, people to use it. And it's called uh, i3WM, and it's uh, on i3WM.org, and it's like uh, awesome but better, and uh, way better, and uh, it's a uh, very really the most flexible thing I ever seen but quite easy to use so I will give the link and I want to encourage people trying it and be, be out um, and this my second pick uh, is a French uh, comic uh, uh, author uh, watching a comic uh, BD, uh, comic uh, comic strips on the internet and he's, he translates some of his uh, uh, strips uh, in English, so you can you can read it uh, too. And it's it's uh, an amazing artist, and is uh, and is quite geeky, and he, he has a lot of very uh, cultural geek uh, things, and uh, some pixel art are wonderful sometimes, and a lot of steampunk, uh, very and um, crazy crazy stories, and and uh, a wonderful wonderful artist. So uh, Boulet is is called Boulet, <laughs> and his uh, his website is Boulet Corp. And uh, I'll give the link uh, too. And uh, it's it's really really a, a must, masterpiece uh, uh, in the continuous uh, continuous producer of masterpiece. So I, I would encourage you to to read this guy. And he, yeah, he did I, a collaboration with uh, Zach Weiner, who is uh, the author of uh, SNBC comic that a mm. lot of geek, geek knows. So it's quite, uh, it's becoming slowly known, I think, in the US, but not yet uh, as much as uh, he should. So. Yeah, I, I second Gabriel. Boulay is amazing. <laughs> I love it. So, so that's my two picks. <coughs> Very cool. Well, hey, you know, this has been an incredible episode. I, I have learned so much, and, and I was already impressed with Kivi, and, it's, and I now realize there's a whole constellation of, of sub-projects and, and co-projects under the covers there, and I've walked away even more impressed. First of all, thank you all, and especially those of you who are up at now probably 3 o'clock in the morning yes. taking the time to talk to us here in the East Coast of the United States. And, and thank you all for, for just for being such amazingly talented, creative, technically uh, astute people for creating this awesome piece of technology that we love to play with. Uh, we look forward to seeing what, you know, what there is to come from, from you guys. And, and uh, hopefully as a result of this podcast, we can get more people to pitch in and help you along with some of the heavy lifting. Yeah, definitely. Thank you all for joining us. It's been a lot of fun. It's great talking to you all. So for anybody who would like to follow you or find out more about what you're up to, uh, if you could each just provide a way that people can keep in touch and see what you're see what you're doing. It was really fun not talking to you guys. Thanks a lot. Yeah, that Thanks was great. Right. Very interesting. Uh, I think we are we we have a dedicated page about us uh, on the on the kiwi.org website, the about us page. So you can you can see about us here, and uh, the most of the active community activity is happening on the Google Groups and and on the IRC channel. So it's you can go over here and and talk to us, or or anyway we we try to be to cover all the bases, or uh, be it Twitter or or Facebook or Google Plus or over or, or Reddit, or we try to be everywhere, but uh, the the place we are the most active usually is the IRC. So, if you want, come see and us here. Great, and thank you, Chris and Tobias, for inviting us because <coughs> also yeah. this is the first time we are meeting in voice. <laughs> yeah, okay. that's great. <laughs> wow. So thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. Well, it's Skype. It's pretty easy. So you guys should maybe take advantage of it and and uh, yeah. and have meetings every once in a while. Although I know time zone difficulties can be yeah. can be a bit of a challenge. But 
sometimes it's worth it because it's a higher bandwidth mode of communication, right? I mean, like, IRC and email and all this are, are wonderful, but sometimes the human voice, there's there's nothing like it. If you can't have face-to-face, this is the second best thing. I think the only thing stopping us from doing that till now was hesitation. And we'll definitely take a cue and try to continue this. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm glad we could get that started for you. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thanks.